ladies and gentlemen, thank you for staying late, and especially the consultants who wonder how they pa failed the past the MD part to so many years back. And today I will te tell them how they passed it. Say, as a registrar, I was not one of the best, oh, sort of very keen, no oh, bright, oh, so. And uh, I spent two, two and a half to three years of my registrar period just sort of playing and sort of uh, helping my wife to sort of get pregnant and all that. And all of a sudden the exam came and I realized I myself can't pass this. So I had to have divine support. So I had to juggle between studying and going to the temples and sort of Bodhi Puja and Pirit Nul and all that. And then there were some examiners who were very nasty. We knew that if you go to that examiner, that you are going to be hammered and you are going to fail. And we had to go and smash coconuts. So I'm hoping that they would break their legs or meet with some accidents on the way to the exam. Unfortunately, they didn't. So I'm a, I became a pillar of success. And today, I'm going to tell you I, how I passed my exam after so many times. So to know this, you should know how you are marked in MD in medicine. Everybody knows. A written component, uh, now you have to have 50% of this. Written component 30, long case 25, short case 25, Viva 10, and OHT communication skill 5 each. But the beauty is that short cases, you have to have a minimum of 50%. Uh, borrowing heavily from Dr. Shami, from Dr. Shami Radhi Silva, who did this uh, same lecture four years back, she says you have to do the, the when you are doing a short case, you are marked on the technique, and should be, you should be methodical, systematic, sequential, and incorrect technique. You get 30. Eliciting time 30, and interpretation 30 percent, and patient welfare is 10 percent. Looking at this, you would wonder. If you do a cardiovascular system examination, general excavation nicely, and inspe uh, inspection, what pulse, BP, blood pressure, uh, and precordium, all that, and in elicit, and be a re gentleman and say amma, coma, then all that, and be very good in patient welfare. You get 70% of this, and when the patient has a VSD, you go and tell them the patient has MS. You have got 70 percent. It doesn't happen in the exam. Right. I'm going to base this lecture on a couple of things. If you have already passed your selection exam, or you're going to do the selection exam and become a registrar one day, if you have passed the selection exam and you have, uh, find a trainer, choose a graveyard. The graveyard is, ladies and gentlemen, is a very strict examiner, a formidable examiner, you know them, right? You pray that you don't go to them in the exam. So if you choose a graveyard, a ward, a unit, presided by an examiner, that examiner, that trainer is somebody who's meticulous, who drive their registrars crazy by teaching them how to do this, do that, and fail them in the ward rounds and make them stressed up. And they would master the technique. Not only that, the trainers can't examine their trainees in MD part two, and you will not get that trainer in the exam. Right. So if you are already a registrar, how are you going to pass this? Listen to your boss. He wants to teach you, he wants to show your physical signs. You are looking here and there and he, you are not interested. He's better than you in physical signs, at least in most of the instances. Uh, uh, the exception is my unit. Uh, read textbooks on clinical science. In my era, it was Hutchison. Do you still read Hutchison? Is it still there? Right, you read textbooks of clinical science and master it, because your examiners still read them to brush up, closer to the exam. Right, I think uh, short cases in training is a very underrated thing. Because most of the units, 
do teaching sessions on loan cases, the 25% of the marks where you have to get 40% of that. Uh, short cases not given prominence by trainers or trainees, there's no glamour, there is, it doesn't improve your knowledge. Uh, right. So, that many a trainee but fails this exam in short cases. So, to overcome this, get your boss to do at least one short case a week and mark you. Just don't let him do a short case, mark you. So, how much time do you get for a short case in exam? It's 10 minutes, six for examination, two to present, and two to answer. And during a, tra during a training, at least, during the latter part of the training, try and finish the examination in five minutes. And during registrar days, this is that you do. This is all that I could put in this, practice, 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 which I didn't. Right, so if you practice, Closer to the exam, now recent, recently, after passing the, the theory part, we saw these registrars running like mad hatters from one ward to the ward, looking for short cases, waking my patients at 10 p.m. instead of getting them out of the bed and leaning forward and listening to that aortic regurgitation. And they want to see as many cases as possible. Ladies and gentlemen, the number matters, but quality matters more. So take time. Present as if you are doing it for the exam. Best is to get a consultant to be the examiner, or a regi senior registrar, or a fellow trainee to observe you and critically analyze the problem. Now, don't listen to the people who fail the exam, who have already failed. Yes, they wouldn't have failed if they knew how they, why they failed. So they will tell you, you know the stories, yes, it's not. And attend mock exams, because most of them are past examiners and trainers and volunteer to be the guinea pig. On those exams, you, now close to the MD, part, MD, you come to a big mock exam, you can hardly find a volunteer to take a short, long case or a short case. It's difficult, so be the volunteer. And it's easy, now it's better to fail in the mock rather than the MD. On the exam day, ladies and gentlemen. The examiners arrive much before you do to the exam. They come and they sit and socialize, hello, my chang, and take kiribat, then sort of have a tea, and gossip a little, then go to the, the main exam hall and give over the respective short case given to them for the day. And each short case is examined by, a, now the examiner will be a consultant in internal medicine and consultant in the base specialty, a neurology in neurology. The cases come from wards. Therefore, they are common. Now don't, you will be surprised if you get a patent doctor's arteriosis on exam day for the CVS. You should be, uh, either you are mad or the examiners are mad or it's your utter uh, bad luck. So you see the, 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 you know how difficult it is to get the, the short cases for the exam. You get all the cases from the wards. And uh, the calibration is by both examiners independently. The examiners go each person and you go and say, you examine. And first you see whether it's a fair case. Matapuluvandha me case ka pass in. And if, the, if you can't pass, you say, tell the, the coordinator, Macha Maker and Tikak Amarui, oh, it's unfair, shall we get another case? So the coordinators have extra cases in reserve. Right? This happens in exams. So you go, you, know, the, you go and complain that the cases were bad, but the examiners have already seen the bad cases and sent them back to the wards. So the cases are selected by the exam coordinators. The examiners have to satisfy themselves on the, the presence and absence of clinical signs, and they discuss on the interpretation and agree on the minimum signs to be elicited. Now, a patient with mal, uh, 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 mitral stenosis, pulse, uh, irregular, you should have it, no? Yes. And uh, should we have a, 
uh, tapping apex, should, should we say that tapping apex should be, uh, yes, yes. Uh, and all that they, they first discuss among themselves and the signs that carry extra marks. There is this uh, patient with uh, aortic regurgitation, right, if the, uh, the candidate says there is this neurosis sign, shall we give him extra marks? Will not fail him if he doesn't say neurosis uh, sign. So likewise the examiners discuss among themselves and the differential diagnosis they discuss and they say, right, which a muta make a me, AR ekatheneka, MS ka kiwotna fail karadoni. Yes, yes, we'll fail him. This is how the, the thing goes. So the pay, the the important now if you if you come up with the like earlier, if you are a real gentleman, you do the, the correct technique and all that, but come up with a very wrong diagnosis, I think you should be failed. Calibration remains the same, as Anuja said, the whole day, and agree on the command, instructions given to the candidate. And they print it and paste it on the cubicle outside. So when you go there, so you, you don't worry about these curtains and the other, and uh, whether we should ask for a chaperone or that already provided. And uh, you as the candidate, don't speak with the people who did the short cases on the previous day. Don't, never, right? Keep your phone switched off because those people who have done those short cases, they were the tremendous stress and their perception is not always the real life. And don't believe the details of leak cases. Right, when, when there's a leak case, the second person comes and sort of discusses the leak case, we know that it has been leaked. And usually it doesn't happen also. Examiners are all human, right? They are not there to fail you. And uh, don't be jubilant when you see a lenient examiner. They have failed a lot of candidates in their past. And when you see a tough examiner, don't despair. Because this course of candidates have passed after appearing before them and they have a probably an unfair label as a tough examiner. I worked with these so-called tough examiners and found that they are the best examiner that a candidate gets. Right, as forget the, now, when you do the short cases, when you go from one case to the other, forget the previous case, even if I failed, if you see him that, fail. You can easily compensate from the second because there are five theses and you should, the cumulative mark should be 50% and read the instructions. Right, why should you read the instructions? Now the, when you go to the respiratory case, examine this patient's respiratory system posteriorly and don't waste time in checking the patient's chest anteriorly but trachea is a must. So when you are asked to examine the respiratory system posteriorly, what can it be? It should be a effusion, velcro crackles, or consolidation. That's what I thought. And if you are asked to examine the patient anteriorly, the, my first thing would be, would this patient have an apical flattening, apical fibrosis? And if the, the instruction is examine this patient's pulse and proceed, if you get the irregular irregular pulse, this patient should have MS. If the patient has a collapsing pulse, it should be AS, AR, sorry. And if you if you don't know why the hell am I going to sort of pulse, check the pulse and now this is not irregular also, it's not collapsing also, should be a slow rising pulse of AS. Then don't forget to go back to general examination and go methodically, starting from the general examination and proceed. How you are marked? Professionalism and patient welfare. Don't irritate the examiners. After all, they are human. So this will be important to uh, how you greet them, right? Uh, the way you stand. Right, I'll have to show you how the, ex the candidates do this. They Do that. The examiners are human. They try to concentrate your clinical examination and be fair, but there's a thing called the subconscious mind. 
right? As you go in, take the whole thing in. You've seen so many cases. You've walked into the ward, and how many patients have you diagnosed on site? So you have to take the whole thing in. Absorb the patient as you go in. General examination is very important. Say, a CVS, as you walk in, we'll discuss this later, uh, you see an uh, old man, sort of, what? Can this be uh, sort of uh, MVP? Is it more likely that it's an AS? Or a young woman, could this be MVP or ASD? Right? So that's the, that's the, as you go in, that's what you see. Look for hard signs, start the methodical, be methodical. Starting from head to toe, but remember what you are going to see in the head. In the exam, you can't sort of count in your head and sort of, okay, what did I miss, all that. You don't have time to think and proceed. It should be automatic. That's why the practice, practice, practice should come. So remember the sequence for each system. If you have to try the try and remember the sequence in the exam, pulse, BB, JP, precordium, it's best that you do the exam next time. Base your diagnosis on hard facts. Discuss as if you are with a peer, right? So the, the candidates impress the, the examiners. I can still remember in the exam, uh, the candidate said, uh, this patient has a AS, uh, sorry, AR, but I don't think that he has a AS is because of this, but then he has a, the uh, sound conducting into the neck, but there is no murmur here, and you can hear the, uh, the second heart sound well. She said, the patient has a AR and a, and a narrowed carotid. So it's a carotid breathe that you hear rather than a murmur. So you, you discuss as if you are between two consultants discussing. We'll go to the systems, CVS, general examination, all that. And then what are the possibilities in a cardiovascular system? Only few. The, the, the mitral valve complex problems, the aortic valve complex problems, and the MVPs, ASDs, VS, uh, B, sorry, it's a VSD, Eisenmengers, and Fellows. So MS, when, the patient, when you go there, it's a female in their for, in her 40s. And if you have an irregular pulse, a submemory scar, say, see, with the, with the mitral restenosis, a tapping apex palpable S2 in the, the pulmonary area. These are the hard things. You present them, but methodically. MR, the shift, apex is shifted. So if you have a MS with a shifted apex, you think whether, the, whether there is any other reason for this patient's volume overload, whether the patient has an additional MR or whether the patient has an additional AR. So think, but in the exam you don't have a clear head. But if you have done this in the past, you will do this. Right, uh, AS, older person, slow rising pulse, heaving apex, ejection slick murmur, reading the carotid. So those are the hard things. AR is a very important thing. When a patient has a collapsing pulse, proceed to the other signs, apex and uh, endoscopic murmur, sorry. Uh, if you have all but no endoscopic murmur, if you have failed to examine this patient leaning forward in expiration, you deserve to fail. Because in the exam, you think that the patient has one, but in the recordial examination, you have failed to detect one when the patient was lying down. But if the examiners see that you have not examined the patient in the correct position and failed to detect the end early diastolic murmur, do you deserve to be passed? No. So in the interpretation, it's very important you have to say that this patient has a MS or MR, the severity, and the dominant pathology. Why do you say that the dominant pathology is this? 
and the patient with a, a congenital heart disease, a rheumatic heart disease, or degenerative disease, and you are in a MS, you have to say that this patient has mitral stenosis uh, with mitral regurgitation. I think the MS is the, the, the prominent lesion, dominant lesion, uh, because the, the first sound is very loud. And uh, I think it is rheumatic in origin. The patient has, is, uh, the, is complicated with pulmonary hypertension and pulmonary edema, and there is no evidence of infective endocarditis. Respirate system, again, general, the, the correct sequence. What are the possibilities? These are the things that you get in the exam. Do you ever get a patient with uh, uh, pneumothorax? So, so don't think that you get a pneumothorax in the exam. So if you, if you go and de detect a pneumothorax in the, the uh, long case, either you are a genius uh, who are the, the people have sort of sent the, uh, who the, the coordinators have detected the person, brought the patient, the patient has unfortunately developed the pneumothorax there, and you have saved the patient's life by detecting it and sending patient the whole ward, but uh, most likely you will be failing the exam. Uh, so these are the things that you get. Uh, remember, the interpretation should be for the particular patient. So you get uh, plural effusion on the right side, the elderly cachectic man with clubbing, and uh, plural effusion there. And when the examiner asks, okay, tell me the, the, the reason for his plural effusion, you start saying, sir, the, 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 there are these transudates and exudates. Transudates are this, 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 this. Exudates are this, 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 this. Okay, you pass a final MBBS exam. Abdomen is a very easy thing to pass. This is where you uh, get all the marks. What is there? It could be the liver, the spleen, liver than the spleen, the balatable masses, unilateral, bilateral, and transplanted kidney. And uh, most unlikely that you would give a, they would give a graduate uterus or a, or, a, or a ovarian neoplasm. No. So don't miss the sequence, inspection, palpation, percussion, auscultation, preceded by general examination. And don't forget to examine for the bone marrow scar. Right? We all forget. So general examination, look for the bone marrow scar. You have to give the pathology differential diagnosis, etiology, and complications. If you don't find anything in the abdomen, think about the balatable masses that you have failed to find, or the spleen, which is just below where I would expect. Sometimes the spleen is a little below where I would expect it. CNS another graveyard, remember the sequences, read the instructions correctly, examine the upper six cranial nerves, or the examiner the motor system of the volumes and proceed, and gait and proceed. But when you are asked to do that, you do that first, but don't forget the general examination where you would be looking for wasting, fasciculation, thickened nerves, rashes, and thickened ear lobes. These are... Uh, constellation of things that you would get in CNS. Uh, the upper motor and lower neural and neural palsies, cranial combinations. Uh, don't expect a very easy uh, Bell's palsy. And hemiplegias, paraplegias with or without sensor level and sacral sensation, the, the candidates forget most of the time. Cerebellar signs and peripheral neuropathy. Peripheral neuropathy is surprisingly a common thing in MD. MD. The other systems, uh, the, the candidates like it, and we are blamed for sort of giving away free marks. The dermatology, rheumatology, musculoskeletal system, and endocrinology, you have to go through your books and, sort of, and read them thoroughly and be prepared for each presentation. Remember, the examiners, they are to pass you. You have to help them. And good luck. Do you need good luck? 
unless you are prepared. If you are unprepared, you need loads of it. The acknowledgments, I had to borrow a lot from Professor Shamila Silva's presentation on the same subject at SLCIM four years back. And my colleagues at NHSL who have passed scores of candidates at MD and shared their experiences, they told me a lot on how to fail. The senior registrars of board 42 and 56A who have recently done the exam have a faint memory how they passed MD. Thank you. <laughs>